This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, organizers of the 23rd annual Learn to Homebrew Day, coming up on this Saturday, November 6th. Learn to Homebrew Day is an opportunity to celebrate and spread the joy of the most rewarding and delicious hobby of all time. To encourage new and longtime homebrewers to join the fun, the AHA invites you to take $5 off a print or digital membership with the code Learn to Brew 21. That's Learn the Number 2 Brew 21. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash LTHD to learn more and get involved. homebrewersassociation.org slash LTHD. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 4th, 2021. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Johan the Brewer from Mountain Fork Brewery talks about brewing delicious, traditionally inspired beers in the woods of southeastern Oklahoma with local river water. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters will see this week an early release of our video episode featuring Steve Wilkes's Tasty Martson. And at some point, I'll release a bonus video I shot where I use the Instant Pot to make a dish with homemade fermented sauerkraut and homemade chicken broth. That was a delicious dinner, or three. Uh, this week I, I did something I, have, uh, I haven't done in a long time. I made a starter. That's right, I dusted my stir plate off and made a two-liter starter for an eight-month-old package of L09 Cape Bueno, a lager yeast from Imperial, uh, and that's twice the recommended shelf life. Uh, I've been meaning to do something with it, and it's been sitting in the beer fridge, so I put a cup of Pills and Light dry malt extract, and sorry, I didn't I didn't weigh it for metric, and I put it uh, into a two-liter starter, and I boiled it for a, a, a 10 minutes or so in an Erlenmeyer flask and chilled it in an ice bath and, and put it onto the stir plate with the yeast. Now, the first time I tried to make a starter with fresh, fresh imperial yeast, uh, within an hour, literally, the flask was overflowing. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> this time, uh, the fermentation was less aggressive, of course, but the but the yeast was done in a couple of days, and it's now chilling in my kegerator. And my plan is to brew a a lager with ten Lovabon Munich malt and some Satz hops, and to add some rosemary from the garden at the end of the boil to try to mimic uh, a spruce character. And you may remember I made a, a rosemary IPA a while back that was was pretty darn delicious, so I'm hoping to get to that by the end of the week or so. Speaking of our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast, Casey from Imperial is sending me a packet of something exciting. W25 Lactobrevis from Imperial is now in homebrew pouches. Lactobrevis, as the name implies, is a strain of Lactobacillus brevis, and Casey says it's great for kettle souring. It's extremely hop sensitive, so you want to collect your wort and heat it up to sanitize it uh, without adding any hops, and then you can you can chill it down to like 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe uh, 37 C, which is 100. Uh, anyway, you can get the uh, <laughs> add the Lactobrevis, and uh, Imperial says. It'll typically drop the wort pH to 3.3 in one to four days, depending on the temperature and the inoculation rate. So uh, I st I've still got a can of passion fruit puree that I've been wondering what to do with. And I think a, a kettle-soured passion fruit beer sounds delicious. You know we love Imperial. With a pitch rate of 200 billion cells per easy-to-open package, my stir plate is usually du usually dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity uh, five-gallon batches, unless I'm bringing back some yeast that's twice as old as the recommended shelf life. Ask your local homebrew shop about W25 Lactobrevis and check out Imperial Organic Yeast at imperialyeast.com. 
Okay, if you've heard the show that I recorded at the Tulsa Beer Invitational in September, you may remember Johan the Brewer from Mountain Fork. How could you forget? A very energetic guy. I sampled a few of his beers there, and they were all delicious. And I was impressed by his knowledge and enthusiasm, so I wanted to hear more about brewing tasty beers in the forests of southeastern Oklahoma. Johan the Brewer, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Greetings. Thank you for having me today, sir. Yeah, I I should say welcome back because we met at the Tulsa, uh, the Tulsa Craft Beer Invitational uh, back a couple of months ago, and I was so impressed with your beers and your personality and your knowledge that I wanted to hear more from Johan the Brewer. So, so welcome back. Well, thank you, and that's very kind of you. Uh, Just another another guy doing the. Best history lesson I can. <laughs> You're continuing on the tradition. <laughs> well, let's get Figuratively. some let's get some history from you uh, before we talk about where you are now. Where have you been? How did you start in brewing? And and talk about your career a bit. Yeah, I get shy about this conversation. However, I'll do my best. Um, so I, I started my chemistry and engineering in the Navy. Uh, I was on ship detail work. Uh, Mostly through 9-11, that was most of my Navy career, so that's all uh, really important to me, and uh, I've traveled the country and traveled the world uh, with the Navy and civilian sector work after I got out. Uh, However, through that time, um, you know, there was naturally drinking because I was a sailor, and my lineage is uh, a Viking. You've met me. I'm six foot three and 300 pounds. I'm not a tiny person. Uh, (laughs) Scandinavian roots and all that, but... uh, uh, beer, you know, once I, you know, once I began drinking and finding out that beer across the world is different and, you know, especially in Europe, um, you know, I really kind of latched on to it. And then when I got out of, uh, when I got off the ocean, I uh, had a friend that was the first time I'd see a carboy in a closet doing its fermentation and it's just swirling and it's got an airlock on it. And I, I was captivated then and the science you know, I wish you could see inside a stainless steel fermenter or put a GoPro in there and see it. Um, it's still one of the neatest things, you know, next to the human body, you know, all the science and, and the just pure magic that goes into that. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's the, for us, it's the final frontier beer. I, uh, no, I, under, I understand the compulsion. I, I, I brew in glass carboys a lot of the times. And I, right here beside me, I've got a, a two liter starter. Uh, with an eight-month-old uh, packet of uh, Imperial Organic Yeasts Que Bueno swirling away beside me, and and it's and it's nice and happy, and it's it's just something about seeing the bubbles come up, and and you know, number one, you didn't screw up; it's working. The <laughs> 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 visual act, visual signs are so important for men, and men generally, but yes. <laughs> and then number two, it's a, you you've got a partnership with another living set of organisms there you're you're making something together yes you have to you have to treat it you know it, it's a pet until it's done um and then you, you know. eat it, <laughs> <laughs> it only, you only rent it for a little while so especially depending on how many you rent uh but uh you know shortly after that uh you know i did home brewing um for a little while and then i pretty much jumped into the professional section very quickly um, you know, with my background, it was easy enough to, to jump in. So I did, and uh, I traveled across the country, uh, brewing again from two barrels up to 200 barrels systems, uh, corporate facilities down to mom and pop shops. And, uh, you know, now I'm at a 20 barrel facility, uh, that's a, a mom and pop board membership, but, uh, you know, we, we're doing pretty well. We're in Oklahoma and Texas. And like I said before, we were in your area. And we're looking to get back there. Just distributorship things are always the three tier system are always a you know a balancing game. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, I, I believe in the, the art and the science of very much of brewing and the homebrew communities are always important. Um, and so you know when we went to that festival, it was really great to see that partnership that they did with Foam. Um, and then when we go up to Oklahoma City, we see Red Earth. I've done judging for the blue bonnet before in texas before the covid um you know shut all that down i've done judging 
across the country, I, I ought to have checked my BJCP stuff at some point, but it was more important to be there and be a part of it than, than I put, you know, onto the professional side. And I, you know, if anybody was ever going to ask me, I'd say, no, you, you should keep track of your BJCPs and, and work toward that. Um, cause that, you know, all of us judges, all of us brewers across the country are all held to those guidelines that helps us keep the art and the science, you know, going completely left field, but that doesn't stop some people with pickle beers and <laughs> our fruited things now and got milkshake IPAs. And you won't find those with me. We're very traditional. I mean, we push the boundaries, but I don't know. <laughs> there's, a, there's some stuff out there. This is the second time we've chatted and the second time you've mentioned pickle beers in a disparaging way. <laughs> Have you drank one more than one? Huh? Have you drank more than one in one sitting? <laughs> no. I, okay, fair enough. <laughs> our, well, our, our sponsors, Desiree and Dave uh, from High Gravity, on whose parking lot we were on that day that I met you, they ha- they actually had a pickle beer on tap that I tasted after I talked to you. <laughs> and it was it was good. I, now, I like there are, se- there are several, you know, kind of off-the-wall beer styles that I like like a very short pour of just for the fun of it. And then, but you're right. I, you know, I don't know that I would have had a, you know, a whole, whole pint of that, but you know, I like, Especially two. <laughs> I like, I like, uh, I, I like playing outside the bounds every now and then, and, you know, cause you, cause you learn stuff there. I agree. However, when you have 2000 pounds of grain or 600 gallons, some professional guys say, I got to be able to sell this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And you're making two gallons? Absolutely. Let's go dill. Let's go, you know, fun stuff and, you know, white chocolate and everything else. However, there is some balance games when you have to keep the lights on. So I hear um, you. Unfortunately, I, I get a little, perhaps uh, I lose my, my artness for the science aspect there. Yeah, I, I play mostly around with, uh, on the weird batches, I, I do mostly one gallon batches. So, you know, my, my, my booberry. A uh, kettle soured beer was only a gallon, so <laughs> you know eight pints. You know, hey, I can share eight pints with friends and have some fun, and it's great. Uh, you know, and I've got eight hundred pints of something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we are, we, we, you know, when you get a chance to come up here, we live in the forest. Um, you know, we don't get cell service. You know, we don't. People are supposed to turn their phones off and hang out with people when they come up here. And we have a lake, and it's on a uh, Oklahoma State Park, and you know, we get a lot of tourists into our tap room slash restaurant. However, you know, even then, you know, uh, getting rid of 800 pints of something, it's not always the easiest thing. <laughs> so talk about Mountain Fork. Uh, you know, talk about a bit about the background and, and sort of the focus of, of uh, where you are. So Mountain Fork Brewery was established uh, late 2015. Uh, it was a home brewer, a, a veteran, uh, an Army vet from Vietnam, is one of our good friends of our board members. Um, and he used to do homebrew wine and, and uh, beer and the whole nine yards. And uh, so we actually have a, a spot for him. And the first brewery we built was a two barrel system. And we built a little parking spot sign with, you know, uh, Vietnam veteran only all others will, will earn this spot. Um, and uh, he helped build that brewery because it was started from homebrew and our board, our chairman of our board, um, his family, his married family is from China and he went over there and bought a brewery without telling anybody. <laughs> uh, and so our, 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 our uh, vet guy, his name is Ed. Ed gets a phone call from our chairman and it's like, Hey, I bought a brewery. And he's, you did what? <laughs> uh, so Ed was the one that helped build this. When it came from uh, China, the same kind of as our 20 barrel system, um, it kind of comes in an Ikea instructions with pictures and numbers <laughs> and you're supposed to put it together. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it gets a little interesting. Um, but that was established in late 2015 and they started brewing on that two barrel system. And at that time, uh, this area was still very underdeveloped. It had been starting. Um, we have about 3000 cabins in this little, um, I guess, which is probably about 10 miles just north of Broken Bow. Um, Hocha Town is not actually got a mail uh, post office or anything, so we're not incorporated. However, it's in the process. Um, and so the area of Hocha Town got its name because this was P. 
people used to sling hooch through here. <laughs> uh, this was this was the drag strip of the hooch town, um, and there's a lot of guys that have a lot of uh, drag strip racing and a lot of that homestown. If you go down to Paris, just south of here, there's a drag strip there because everybody was coming up through Paris and into this area to sling hooch. So hooch town became was hooch town. However, everybody really liked that small gathering space that was created then, and it was you know. Everybody was the hangout. It was a local cheer spot. Um, it did so well, though, that they were like, we're going to build a bigger version. So they went from two barrels to 20 barrels, which in the professional world is a very large jump. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, they had a, a brewer, and he didn't want to make that jump or, you know, not capable from home brew, two barrel to 20 barrel. They brought in another gentleman. Uh, he was here for about a year. And then they, myself, um, with my experiences, instead of traveling, my mom lives on Lake Texoma. I grew on Lake Texoma, grew up on Lake Texoma. And uh, so it was a good area for me um, to come back to. She's retired now and, you know, got to spend time with mom while she's, you know, while she's here, not, you know, morbidly or nothing, but <laughs> good old boy. So uh, I traveled a bunch when I was in the military. And I didn't see her much. So spending time now and then uh, was able to come in here and help kind of refresh their system and get everything going. Because uh, at that time, Oklahoma still was 3-2 law, too. This would mm. be 2018. And that switched in 2018 to where we could actually make beer in Oklahoma. Oklahoma used to have this kind of bubble around it. And you know from Arkansas, the similar, with the dry counties and the wet counties. Like, these are the last couple of states in the country that were, you know, Mississippi, I think, was the last state to allow home brewing. That was 2012 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a lot of stuff to change, a lot of stuff to do. So... I stayed busy for very for, for the next for the next three years, and and now we uh, we're doing well. We're in Houston and Austin. Uh, to answer your first question, though, we are a place of traditional style ales. So you know we've got three light beers that we call our lake beers. Uh, you had a couple of them there at the, the festival. However, we do also still do an IPA. We don't have six IPAs like places in Texas. We have one. Um, we do a pale ale for Veterans Day. It's part of Yakima Chiefs Veterans Select Blend that they do. Um, that'll be coming out next Thursday, which I'm excited about. Um, and then we've got some barrel age projects that you had as well. Um, and you know, to keep things fun for people when they do come up here in the tourist town to have on draft. So I uh, don't know if that answers all the questions, but it answers a couple of them. Oh yeah, yeah. The the beer that I that I sampled on Mike there at the festival of yours was the Three Rivers Blonde Ale. Uh, which is a very nice, uh, uh, solid beer, very drinkable. Uh, you said it had cryo hops in it. Um, so, I mean, are you since you're t- sort of catering to tourists, uh, are the majority of your beers? They, it seems like in tasting the others, and I don't remember the other three uh, that I tasted for some reason. I'm not sure why, but uh, <laughs> you did have the wee heavy there too, which is the barrel aged American oh, scotch. That's right. That's right. Uh, but they, but they were all cleanly fermented, you know, all really well done. Uh, the recipes were nice and balanced. Uh, so it, it, it looks like you are all about drinkability <laughs> you 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 said that you were a wild man at the at the festival, but but your beers don't taste like a wild man brewed them. They're ve- <laughs> they're very. You have three or four sneaky snakes or MFBs at nine percent, and uh, we'll, we'll change your tune. I reckon. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, yes, no, it um, like I said, art and science. Um, we, you know, we definitely want beers that people can enjoy on the lake and still pull the boat in the dock after enjoying them. Um, and at the same time, we want you to have beers around the fire that uh, help you go to sleep that night mm-hmm. um, or whatever mis- mis- mischievous shenanigans you get into. <laughs> um, but, yes, I appreciate the, the, the thought about the beers being clean. Um, science here is very important. I mentioned, I think, before we were on the recording about Anton Parr and using density meters. Um, you know, we get our yeast from BSI out of Colorado. Um, really particular about yeast, um, you know, uh, People always joke uh, about Gordon Ramsay being a crazy person on his shows and flinging plates everywhere and, like, you know, making sure his chefs are doing what they should be. Um, and that's that's a very much a, a brewer's standpoint. If anybody's met professional brewers, there's always a running joke between the board members or the owners. Brewers are special people, air quotes. Um, and that's not wrong. It's just 
you know, you've got a lot of money tied into materials and you want to make sure things are the way they're supposed to be. So we get a little meticulous as professional brewers go. Our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa, posted on Facebook the other day that the Werthog 10-gallon 240-volt system that's similar to what I have is now available for less than a grand. And if my math is right, if you use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks, you can get it for less than 900 bucks. Now, this setup is even a bit nicer than mine because it has a riptide pump. Uh, But it's got the Warthog EBC-130 controller, which I love, and the boil coil heating element. Uh, Tell Santa, what a deal. Now, now this version has the 62-quart Bayou Classic kettle like I have, but you can upgrade uh, for a little more to a spike kettle, if you like. Uh, Check out all the cool electric systems at highgravitybrew.com and see all the things that EBC-75BB uh, will uh, will give you that seventy five dollar discount by clicking on the uh, high gravity ad on the right hand side of basicbrewing dot com. You can take the pain out of propane at family owned and operated highgravitybrew dot com. That's highgravitybrew dot com. Well, let's start at the at the lighter end, uh, literally, uh, because I'm assuming that those are the, the the most difficult to brew. You've got something uh, that. I can't, and again, I can't remember if, if I tried it or not. But but you've got the MF light. Uh, we remember, do remember Mountain Fork. That's the. <laughs> although I guess you could you could you could substitute whatever MF words you wanted to. I guess for the uh, title for TTB purposes. TTB purposes, we're going to say Mountain Fork. <laughs> um, yeah. So that beer is the hardest to make. Uh, it's actually done with brown rice flakes. Um, And I did that on purpose, A, because, again, as I traveled, um, I always make the joke with this beer that it reminds me of sake. Um, You know, when I was traveling, there was the time when sake was going from cold to hot and it was having its own resurgence overseas. Um, So that rice does a couple different things. A, it lowers the carb and the calorie content of the beer. It actually is, for most people that have problems with beer, it actually is more like... uh, bio-friendly for your stomach you know it doesn't bloat up people as much um and we wanted we actually pay the extra money there's a weird law in there that actually makes it really difficult for small breweries to use the word l-i-t-e or l-i-g-h-t because you have to pay extra money for a third-party lab to do the test to get the actual verification of the nutritional data Hmm. and that's in there so budweiser can can hold on to light or light beers as it is which again you know three-tier system and beer recotics mm-hmm. but uh so that beer again uh yeah pilsen malt uh brown rice flakes it's can be a pain in the to louder we mm-hmm. have to be very careful on that um it does not like to louder well lights the rice holes um our system here is nice though we when you come and visit we have a separate mash and louder system um so that helps us be able to do some of these like our MFB, our stout has uh, 13 different grains in it. Wow. Um, and the friability of, you know, all those dark grains don't like to louder well. Um, and so, you know, uh, that helps having that separate system. Uh, I don't, for professional guys, having a stacked mash louder is not easy. And then after the light, you said the Three Rivers, and then we also have the Rooster and the Timber Creek. And all of those are under 5% and that are usually available year round. Um, well, let's talk a bit a bit more about the about the light beer. What's the what percentage of the brown rice flakes do you have in there? It's got to be a lot if you said it's it's hard to uh, hard to louder. Usually, um, I've been bouncing back and forth between twenty and thirty percent. Thirty percent is extremely difficult, and twenty is a little more. Um, and just finding that right mouthfeel, and then finding the calorie content. Um, when we sent it off, we had it at twenty percent. And we came back in at six and a half grams of carbs, which most breweries are using an enzyme. And I don't want to use an enzyme for that regards of taking your carb content down because I think it it affects the taste when I've had it from other breweries. Um, and so most of the time you'll see another brewery attempting this and they get it at eight grams of carbs. Obviously, uh, three and a half grams of carbs is Nicolob Ultra. We're not that far. We're not that good. But again, we're using real ingredients, and I think that makes a big difference. 
Yeah, I was going to ask if you had to use enzymes or not, but I guess uh, there's there's plenty of enzymes uh, in the base malt itself, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, yes, um, Pilsen malt, you know, being really good, we do use um, phosphoric acid if we need to adjust uh, pH uh, generally. And our water source, again, here, Mountain Fork River is our uh, – uh, we get our water from and the three rivers is because of Glover, Little River, and Mountain Fork are the surrounding rivers here in the forest. Um, but all we do is carbon filter and then run through a UV light and then, you know, add salts, of, you know, according to style guidelines. Hmm. Wow. So you're, you're straight from the source. We are. And that's one of our, we've got kind of two taglines for the brewery. One is from a good source comes a good beer. And the other part of that is creatively crafted, you know, with you in mind, you being the customers uh, or the guests, and, you know, fellow drinkers. Again, we want those beers to be your everyday drinkers that are in the in the fridge, you know, the tried and trues, you know. Everybody wants that $20 bottle or that fancy once, you know, occasional beer. Um, however, we'd like to be the beer that, you know, you go to every day or well, not every day or whatever it is for everybody. So um, we like to be that mainstay beer. Do you have to monitor the, the chemistry of the water depending on the time of year, or is it fairly stable? Uh, it is fairly stable uh, with our carbon filter especially. Um, we do run a steam boiler here, though. So I have a chemist uh, as part of our steam boil chemistry, uh, water chemistry that comes in, and he does both of those, and we keep an eye on everything, and I usually run uh, a water, independent water test every year as well. Um, and I've done it on seasonals because the you know with the lake uh feeding the mountain fork river and with the dam that we have here that keeps the lake going up and down and last year with the droughts and other issues um i was definitely a concern but uh it is stayed actually fairly stable hmm. let's talk about your star your uh, american stout you said did you say 13 different grains i did I, but off the top of my head i think it's 13 because um it <laughs> You know, there was a couple of articles written in uh, Craft Beer and Brewing about browns uh, and stouts that, you know, you do have to have stuff to keep it in there to make it something different. You know, I, one of my travels was up in Montana. Moose Drool is the beer of that state. Um, and Moose Drool is a great brown. However, it's very much like Newcastle. It's very light uh, and almost amber. You know, it doesn't. Our brown is our crumpet. Uh, and it's an English style brown. And, you know, I use a, a fair amount now of the Brees Care Brown malt to help it really get that character um, of the older style English browns where, you know, we're actually canning that. My crew is canning that right now. They're probably wondering where I'm at. However, <laughs> um, they're canning that beer. And we let that sit even uh, for about six weeks before I even release it to the public. We just released it actually this past Friday. Uh, we're going on to more of a seasonal route with that now. And, you know, it's got I think nine different grains in the brown. Wow. Uh, and, and it just, you know, we want that, that's that artist brush, right? You know, you're not going to paint with one hue of blue. You want to paint with different shades of blue and, and give some, some texture and everybody to have a different taste aspect and something for people to talk about. You know, that's that fun side of sitting at the bar and listening and, to guess, talk about the beer when they have it. Um, you know, we actually did it on nitro for the release and regular. Um, so we, we, we do our best to have some fun with things too. You are the Bob Ross of brewing. Happy little accidents. That's what we call it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you, if you put 13 different, uh, uh, grains in a, in a beer, how do you keep it from turning into, you know, mud? Uh, you know, if you, they say, if you, you know, if you put, if you put too many paints in the paint box together, all you're going to wind up is, you know, something like a dark, muddy brown. How do you, how do you keep uh, the, uh, the flavors balanced? Well, uh, that's part of the balance of art and science. Definitely. Um, I definitely give a lot of credit to Brees uh, for making great malts. Uh, and then the other side of that is, um, um, I wouldn't say necessarily trial and error, but, uh, um, trial and success. <laughs> <laughs> we make, we make errors. You know, every good brewer will tell you, if you haven't dumped a batch, you're not pushing the boundaries. Um, and, uh, 
you know, I think some of it is just uh, a subtle subtleness, uh, as it were, but it's also, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, it's trial, <laughs> trial, but, uh, you know, um, you do taste the differences and, you know, with, uh, the, I want the beer to be able to age. And so there's reasons for that, but you're, you're, you know, thought about the mud, you know, rice holes and the louder, as I said, a separate system helps, you know, the old days of, you know, trying to louder through the igloo thing with the copper thing on the bottom with slits cut into it, you know, mm-hmm. those are great and all, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't always work well either. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, those, those friends of ours called Ninkasi and St. Arnold and, uh, Dionysus. We, we do a lot of talking to those guys. <laughs> Pouring some out into the, into the floor drain as a, as a tribute, sure. <laughs> just as a tribute. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> So talk, I mean, I'm fascinated by the 13 grains. Talk about some, you don't have to give your whole recipe, but but give us a peek into there and why some some grains need to be in there and what, what do they bring to the stout? Um, so, for instance, one of the one of the other monsters I use, uh, I don't use much of, Wireman out of Germany has, the only one, they do a chocolate rye and they do a chocolate wheat. Um those, you know, wheat is going to give you head retention in the beer, um, as well as some flavor uh, and then the coloring of, of your head as well. Um, so as far as science goes, you know, that creates a lot of chemistry parts. However, the taste profile, you know, that rye has a different component taste. And then midnight wheat from Brees, mm. you know, definitely creates its spot. But then pairing those together is the idea. In this case, 13 is, you know, 13 plus or one plus one plus 13 plus nine, the sum is supposed to be greater than the parts. And so when those, when those malts go together, that's the goal then is creating something that is you know, greater than the parts were. And then the, the rye and the, and or especially the rye, but the rye and the wheat also give you a good mouthfeel, I'm assuming. Yes. And then like our stout, you know, I, I generally do a small rest, um, you know, around 140 because we have a steam system. And then, we, you know, we bring that up afterwards. Uh, that first rest usually is, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. And then you've got your next one. We bring in the 153 range uh, to make sure we're getting the rest of our alphas. Um, you know, so our mashes are generally, you know, hour and a half to two hours on a, on a well, two hours definitely on the style. Mm. And talk about that wee heavy. I do remember the wee heavy. And I think you, you asked me to guess what it was, and I think I guessed like a, a – did I guess a double or something like that? And I think they're, they may be kind of in the same family, at least uh, as far as the grain bill is concerned. And, well, yeah, what it throw you off was the barrel aging because it had dried it out a lot more. Um, and so the mouthfeel on a barrel aged beer is definitely going to be a whole other chemistry uh, thing again about just being a little lighter and cleaner. Uh so that we heavy then when we first make it, you know, it's very caramel forward as the style dictates. And the goal is really to um, create that nuance. And then most times a wee heavy really won't taste right until it's barrel aged because the caramel flavors from the bourbon or the whiskey that you're using will, will continue to again, make that some of the, some of the parts being greater than the whole. A conversation and uh it was nine months in a barrel mm. and it's been another probably six months in the can um so it's very clean you know it doesn't come across as a big 12 percent alcohol beer yeah I, I remember it as, as being really drinkable um and i you know i kept waiting for you to like turn your head so that i could snatch like a four pack or something from the <laughs> So, so that so that maybe I could have you know been sipping one right now as as I talk to you, but uh, so it, so in a wee heavy, how much of the caramelization, you know, and and the darkness and the richness, how much is that the grain bill, and how much is it say an extended boil? Uh, for for us, it's it's probably eighty percent the the grain bill, um, and then ten percent the barrel. And then probably 10% the boil because uh, we didn't really do an extended three hour boil as you can do in the, in the old days. And that was definitely the more the case too. If you had a flame 
on your on your kettle like a home brewer would you can really create that that character um with steam it's not as easy mm. um we definitely get the rolling out of our system very well and we get the evaporation that we need um but uh and then just keeping you know keeping as much first wort you know so to speak as you can without watering down your your kettle mm. um that's that's always difficult again from a keeping the lights bills on because you know back in the old days doing a party guy style, so i would keep the money you know you'd be able to save some of that wort from the grain and not dump it down the drain and feed it to the to the cows but uh you know say la vie sometimes you got to do that <laughs> Yeah, we've uh, we've talked recently with the author Peter Simons about uh, party guiling, and uh, yeah, it seems like it would be difficult uh, for you as a brewer to to throw away some sweet wort that's still in the uh, that's still in the grain. Yeah, we heavies, it's really bad. Yeah, it's you got to stop somewhere at twelve bricks or you know somewhere in there, and that's not an easy thing to do. And you know you're you're counting the grain bill cost. But, uh, you know, as I said, c'est la vie, so it goes. So what about, uh, how do you uh, man- manage a, a proper healthy fermentation with your high-gravity beers? Well, the best thing to do is, as I said next to you, you've got a starter going. Um, that, you know, you know, I know homebrew, it's always easier to use dry yeast and dry yeast packets. However, you know, getting a proper Erlenmeyer flask, glass, and keeping that culture, you know, healthy f- you know, we do it on a big boy scale. We we do a, a propagation pitch, uh, usually at least 24 to 30 hours before the brew day, um, and we do it in the tank that the you know the wort's going to go into. Um, but yeah, we make a proper you know 50 gallon pitch. Uh, so ours is a bit bigger, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know on a on a big boy, you know we even up that up to 80 gallons. Wow. Um, to really get things rolling, and we'll use dry malt extract from Brees uh, to uh, you know get that yeast going and healthy, and uh, you know aerate it. Uh, I, I mean, I still I've got homebrew equipment that you know homebrewers used to. I've got a Blickman oxygenation uh, system that I use. Uh, you know, it, um, but oxygenation you know is super important, and you know, allowing that yeast to do what it you know what, allow it to party the way it wants to party, and knowing. Like you said, that whole pet thing when we started earlier talking is, you know, keeping the space, you know, healthy for them, keeping that initial tank, you know, sanitary. You know, I I had recently read, you know, Sierra Nevada, it puts in CO2 gas on their mash ton before they even grain in. and That's not something I do. And it's definitely expensive and definitely something a home brewer doesn't want to do unless, you know, you have enough to do that. But, you know, everybody's got their own little nuances, uh, of every brewery, but the yeast at the end of the day is the true boss of a brew house. And they're, they're such a big brewery that they, they may be recapturing their CO2, uh, you know, and reusing it for the, so they may have their own sort of source of uh, CO2 there on location. I don't know. Yeah. I know Alaskan does that for sure. They do a lot of reclaiming uh, up there in Alaska, Alaskan brew house, but, uh, and then like, yeah, I mean, everybody's, you know, finding their niche, you know, I guess you probably saw Firestone released on earth day. They've got, four acres of you know solar panels on a rotating system that they use in now and um uh firestone odell sierra nevada those are always my recommendations for you know people to go to for um reference beers and styles and new stuff going on so outside of you know your local place like out of where you are core brewing is it core no it's uh one in little rock uh well, one in Little Rock. Lost Forty is yeah, Lost Forty is the biggest in the state. Yeah, and they uh, I've been there. They have a forty barrel brew house, but they brew into eighty barrel fermenters, um, and they make great beer, you know. Um, but as far as the regional big boys go, and Firestone's own now, you know, they're with Boulevard and Omni Gang, but uh, they're still, you know, those are still great brew houses um, that I look up to, and I, you know, read on what they do and. Um, so the other part to answer your question where I'm going with this rabbit hole is uh, keeping up on innovation, reading always, you know, what else, what else did I not know or what else new has come out? So mm-hmm. you know, I'm, don't, I'm not giving up on the knowledge side. That's definitely a brewer's, you know, hidden wrench, if you will. You got to keep, got to keep learning. 
So even though your mind is in the in the traditional as far as the the styles that you brew, you're open to innovation on the different techniques. Absolutely. I you know I read recently a smaller brewery in one of the magazines. You know, there's six different brewing magazines out there now, but uh, or so. And you know, it's you know still traditional methods and finding a new way or finding a way to twist them with a little innovation, yet keeping them you know wholesome. Because at the end of the day, we got to keep the lights on, and anything we can do to help that within balance is, you know, is important. The Ancient Collection is coming back from our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly of Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont. Last week, I told you about veneer, which is wildflower honey fermented on three European yeast strains and carved ash and oak. This week, let's talk about Bragai from the Ancient Collection. Bragai brings wildflower honey, black currants, elder flowers, rose hips, and a touch of juniper berry to create a floral salute to the 18th century Danish meads. Now, the ancient collection is higher in ABV than most Groenfell and Havoc meads. Uh, this one is at 12.5%, but it's perfect for the holiday season. Now, the third mead in the ancient collection is Hegir, which brings European cherries to wildflower honey aged on cherry wood. And it weighs in at 13.4% ABV. Those all sound way good. Free shipping across the country on orders over 70 bucks. Check them out at, uh, check all the honey-based deliciousness while you're at it. At family-owned and operated, Gronfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Let's talk about Sneaky Snake, your Belgian golden. Uh, what goes into that? That is our flagship beer. Um, we we make uh, our normal green labels eight nine percent, um, and then again that was reason we had initially it was nine percent. We changed it to eight nine for Oklahoma law stuff. And anyway, um, I'll get back to why that's important in a minute. However, um, that beer very light. It's uh, Belgian, as you said, but it's on a Pilsner grain bill style. Um, with a little bit of character uh, mouthfeel to it. So even when most people try it for the first time at festivals and, you know, at a friend's house, uh, you won't realize it's 9% or 8%, 9%. Uh, it's very light, easy drinking. Um, the joke is that Sneaky Snake will sneak up on you because it is that light and easy drinking. Um, and, and it has. I've seen people dance on the bar because they drank way in too many. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it, it, you know, people like have two or three sitting at the bar and we ask them to go to the restroom and they stumble. Mm. Okay. You need a glass of water. <laughs> yeah. uh, mm. But uh, we've made our best. My goal was to make that beer very light, easy drinking. And it's kind of a, a hybrid version. That's why I didn't call it a triple. You know, I, I've uh, spent a lot of time in Northern new England area and up there it's uh, the golden monkey out of victory brewing is what a lot of people drink up there. Um, but I wanted to stay away from some of the sweetness that people get carried away with, uh, came with the, either the dextrose or the Belgian candy sugar that Trapels are known for. And so ours has got a light sweetness, but a citrus to it because we use the New Zealand hot Motueka mm. or Motueka. I really like that one, uh, because it brings out some of the Belgian characters and it plays well within that environment. Um, and then where I was going is we make a black label. That's seasonal. That's a 10% version that I let ramp up the fermentation, tweak the grain bill a little bit for kind of that blue Chimay style or um, uh, Carmelite, you know, that kind of, you know, more of the Belgian mm -hmm. and being 10%, it can handle that. Um, and so you know, we do a play on that. And that was also, again, because Oklahoma laws at one point, but now we've turned it into a seasonal. And uh, it goes over really well. You only need a four pack of it, though, so ten percent it'll it will bite. So the so I take it that that since you're looking for drinkability, you're not looking for, or maybe you are, a lot of the sort of yeasty, you know, phenolic-y spices uh, that you get in in some of the Belgian beers. Yeah, our green label has a hint of it. Um, but again, it is, as you said, more drinkable. The black label, I let that rise a little more and have more of that clove and have more of that um, 
play with the malt characters um, that you'll get kind of when you let those those kind of blend together. And we even do a draft only version uh, that we call Hidden Treasure, that it's a fruited version of the snake. Mm. And we've played with different fruits. Um, peach goes really well, which is, you know, historically speaking for German and Belgian beers, um, peach and apricot, you know, will always be around. But that does really well. And then we've tried it with a few different fruits, but hidden treasure because the original Hocha town is actually underwater. When they built the, the lake and the dam, they had to flood the original Hocha town. Um, you can, they have a little diving courses out here and stuff. So the tongue in cheek there was it's a hidden treasure because you never know what fruit it's going to be. And it's also usually nine to 10%, depending on the fruit and fermentation. And we talk about your sugar, what kind and how much percentage wise? Green label, like um, sugar-wise, you know, it's nine percent. But you know, we don't use much dextrose uh, in this house. I don't. We try to be cognizant of that flavor. Um, but then, like, uh, I guess to answer what you're going for is maybe we do about eighty pounds to a hundred gallons, so almost a pound per gallon of fruit. Hmm. Um, so it's you know we kind of find you have to get enough in there for it to. Um, come through in the flavor profile. And and I, I'm assuming that that's put in into like uh, secondary fermentation. Uh, I do it right near the end. So probably around 85 uh, attenuation or so when I get into the 10, 15 range on that beer, specific gravity. I uh, The uh, Oregon fruit people sent me some uh, some cans of fruit puree uh, and I played with those by putting them in the, in the serving vessel, in the, in the corny keg. And uh, uh, the result was that the first few, three or four pints were pretty chunky, uh, but, the, you know, but delicious. The rest of the beer uh, in there, and I did a hard seltzer. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't hang up on me. I did, <laughs> I did a hard seltzer. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, actual unfermented fruit in the serving vessel is, is a fun thing to play with, too. Have you guys played with that at all? Um, no, I, I rather have them ferment within the product, um, A, for consistency, and B, um, so that when I do the cold crashing and, and I get the flocculation, that I can get rid of the, some of the chunky parts, um, you know, and that way, and, and we can get away with, you know, some inconsistencies from fruit to fruit, and especially uh, that's why we use a, a generic name, Hidden Treasure, or we have a Fruit of the Light that we use one of our light beers and, and we fruit as well. Um, but, uh, no, I, I, you know, A, we use a plastic keg system, which you didn't see at the festival, um, but it's a, what they use internationally because um, of recyclability concerns, but it's gaining popularity here, uh, especially because of sours and, you know, people not knowing how, if your keg got cleaned or not. And mm. for, you know, labor costs of cleaning them and water costs, you know, we're on us, we're on our own little septic system that we maintain. And um, so, you know, having the, and I, I only really have two people in the brew house. We get a couple more come in on canning days. Um, so we're a very small and get mighty crew. And, uh, you know, having to wash kegs is, is not on anybody's list to, to do fun. So, um, yeah, plastic kegs, you don't really take a part to be able to put in the corny keg. So, so yeah, that kind of negates that one right out the gate. But, um, but yeah, for consistency and letting it have its way with it is is what we do. Does having to uh, get rid of a, a bunch of live yeast, does that help with the septic system or not? <laughs> it can, actually. Uh, yeah, you do need some of that, um, those bugs down there. And we get our septic pumped off frequently enough, too. Um, and it balances out with, we, you know, we use a sodium hydroxide for our caustic uh, regimen. And we still, you know, have uh, acid um, for brew house cleanliness reasons and for, you know, acid uh, cleaning of the vessels too. So, um, you know, I, I believe very much in the science of chemistry and, uh, you know, I, that was my, that was my MO back in the day in the, in the military. And, um, you know, when the home brewers, PPW is, you know, the lifeblood and it works great. Um, we use something a little more heavy duty here uh, naturally, but um, yeah, yeah. Getting it pumped off for us and it, it, it does okay. So we, 
you know, we don't have too much concerns, but in the bigger places I've worked, you know, we've had to have holding tanks and you get everything down to a seven pH before it goes into the sewer system. Hmm. Um, and so, I mean, those things are important, but uh, not as concerning here. So, Johan, what's in the future? What's next for you and for Mountain Fork? Oh, fiddlesticks. Um, <laughs> fuggle. Um, it's, it's a cluster, cluster fuggle. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very HR and PC politically attempting. Um <laughs> I don't, I don't guess I have a good answer. I, I hope to, you know, um, like I said, we looking forward to go back to Arkansas. Um, we do have that beer fest. Uh, if you've not heard about in uh, Dallas is finally going to be able to do their big Texas beer fest again. Um, next weekend, I believe the 12th. Wow. Yeah. It's next weekend. Oops. Um, but uh, if you're not going to that one, I would definitely look into it. Uh, that's the big one with, hundred plus breweries nationwide, everything at the Dallas auto convention, but that's the immediate future. Uh, as far as the future, future, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Uh, <laughs> enjoying, enjoying brewing and, uh, living in the forest and, you know, I've been with this brewery almost five years and, uh, we're really excited where we're going and where we're headed, uh, you know, within the, the industry and the community, um, like yourselves, somebody from, you know, that come out in Arkansas and, uh, we've, been received very well and that's been great and uh so i guess continuing that tradition really is the goal awesome well again it's been it's been fun to get together with you again and and uh, hopefully next time it will be in person over a pint that would be great and i made sure your email will go to the right inbox now uh, <laughs> so uh yeah let me know and text me and make sure that i know uh when you're coming up here um but uh yeah, we'll look forward to it and uh, make sure we've got plenty of, of stuff to imbibe with when you do come up. Awesome. Thanks, Johan. Cheers. Well, thanks again to Johan the Brewer. Mountain Fork is definitely on my list of breweries to visit, maybe on our way down south for the holidays this year. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.